Good morning. I'm United States Attorney Zachary Cunha. Thank you for coming today. Um, I am truly delighted to be joined today by the Assistant Attorney General in charge of the Justice Department's Civil Rights Division, Kristen Clark, uh, who regrettably could not be with us here in person, but who joins us remotely from Washington. We are here today to announce the conclusion of a significant civil rights investigation into Washington Trust, a Rhode Island institution and the nation's oldest community bank. Our investigation found that the bank engaged in redlining through discriminatory lending practices that impacted majority black and Hispanic neighborhoods here in Rhode Island. As a result of the Justice Department's investigation, we have reached a settlement with Washington Trust that commits the bank to remedy its past conduct by making available millions of dollars in lending that will directly benefit residents of black and Hispanic Rhode Island neighborhoods. I'd like to briefly introduce Assistant United States Attorneys Amy Romero and Kevin Love Hubbard from my office, whose great work alongside their colleagues from Washington was instrumental in bringing this case and securing this settlement. Assistant Attorney General Clark will speak, and after that, I'll share a few further thoughts about the case, what we found, and the settlement, and then we'll take your questions. Assistant Attorney General Clark, thank you for your partnership, and the floor is yours. Thank you, and good morning. I am Kristen Clark, Assistant Attorney General for the Civil Rights Division of the U.S. Department of Justice. It is my honor to join U.S. Attorney Zachary Cunha of the District of Rhode Island for today's announcement. I'm pleased to announce a major redlining settlement. Today we filed a proposed consent decree that secures a $9 million settlement with Washington Trust, resolving our allegations that the bank redlined predominantly black and Hispanic neighborhoods in the state of Rhode Island. Washington Trust is the oldest community bank in the nation and the largest state chartered bank headquartered in the state of Rhode Island. In our complaint, we allege that despite its expansion, Washington Trust has never opened a branch in a majority black and Hispanic neighborhood in the state of Rhode Island. We also allege that the bank relied on mortgage loan officers working out of only majority white areas as the primary source for generating loan applications and failed to conduct advertising of its mortgage services to compensate for its lack of branches and presence in majority black and Hispanic areas. The complaint further alleges that compared to Washington Trust, over the same six year period, other banks received nearly four times as many loan applications each year in majority black and Hispanic neighborhoods in Rhode Island. Finally, even when Washington Trust generated loan applications from majority black and Hispanic areas, the applicants themselves were disproportionately white. Under the terms of today's settlement, Washington Trust will invest $7 million in a loan subsidy fund that will help borrowers of color access credit, and they will open two new branches to service the credit needs of the black and Hispanic communities in the state of Rhode Island. Through this agreement, we are sending a strong message to the financial industry that we will not stand for discriminatory and unlawful barriers in residential mortgage lending. U.S. Attorney Cunha, our partner in this matter, will discuss this settlement in greater detail shortly. Today's settlement should send a clear message to lenders nationwide that the Justice Department will not stand by in the wake of modern day redlining. We will continue to devote resources to identify redlining and to bring enforcement actions. We will continue to prioritize ensuring that lenders remedy the harms created by depriving communities of color equal access to credit. At the Civil Rights Division, we are committed to combating redlining. Redlining is the discriminatory and illegal practice of denying financial services to residents in certain communities simply because of their race or ethnicity. Redlining harms communities of color by denying them equal access to credit and the opportunity to build wealth it also contributes to the widening racial wealth gap in the United States. 
over the past 10 years, on average, a white family has 70%, was 70% more likely to own a home than a black family. And the median wealth of a black family is $24,000 compared to $188,000 for a white family. A recent study on black home ownership in Rhode Island reveals significant home ownership gaps at the state level. While 62% of people in Rhode Island own their homes, only 30% of black people in Rhode Island own a home. The median income of a black family in Rhode Island is about 40% lower than the median income of a white family. No doubt, these stark gaps are a product of systemic deprivation of credit and wealth building opportunities, including in the form of redlining. In October of 2021, Attorney General Merrick Garland announced the Justice Department's Combating Redlining Initiative, our most aggressive and coordinated effort to address redlining to date. At that announcement, I stated that we have a duty to act now because persisting racial inequality and widening wealth gaps make clear that staying the course is not enough. This resolution adds to the Justice Department's robust record of redlining enforcement. Since 2021, the department has secured agreements in eight redlining cases, resulting in relief just over $98 million. Relief that is going to affected communities in Los Angeles, Houston, Memphis, Philadelphia, Newark, Columbus, and now the state of Rhode Island. Never before has the department resolved this many cases in a two-year period. Those matters also include our $31 million resolution with City National Bank, the largest redlining settlement in the department's history. Our settlements are providing transformative relief for impacted communities in the form of loan subsidy funds, community partnerships and targeted advertising and outreach to previously redlined communities. The loan subsidy funds are used to increase credit for home mortgage, home improvement, and home refinance loans in affected communities. This relief is generating new home ownership opportunities for borrowers of color and providing easier access to home improvement loans so that communities of color can build equity in their homes. We're confident that the actions that are required by our agreement will expand credit opportunities in communities of color across the state of Rhode Island. And we encourage other lenders to be proactive in evaluating their fair lending risks and in embracing opportunities to better serve all communities. Our colleagues in U.S. attorneys' offices across the country are critical partners in this work including the District of Rhode Island, and we're grateful to U.S. Attorney Cunha and his team for their collaboration and partnership with us in this matter. I'll now turn the floor over to U.S. Attorney Cunha. Thank you, Madam Assistant Attorney General. Um, as the Assistant Attorney General made clear, redlining, whether it's driven by overt animus or by knowingly avoiding the obligation to provide adequate and equal access to lending services regardless of community is unacceptable. It's not just a violation of federal law, but it strikes at the heart of one of the core ways that individuals and families can build wealth, stability, and community commitment through investment and home ownership. So let me tell you a little bit more about what we found here. As many of you know, Washington Trust's historical home is in Washington County, Rhode Island. But beginning in 2002, the bank began a substantial expansion, and by 2016, it was effectively a statewide bank. The bank's expansion brought with it an obligation to serve all communities all across the state. As we allege in this case, Washington Trust's lending model relies on bank branches as the linchpin of its lending structure. In other words, the bank relied primarily on mortgage lending officers in branches to generate mortgage loans and develop relationships to serve the credit needs of community members. And because of that business model, where the bank opened branches mattered. We found, however, 
that as it expanded, Washington Trust, as the Assistant Attorney General suggested, did not open a single branch in a majority black Hispanic area. Instead, the bank located its new branches in majority white areas every time. What you see here in uh, orange are the majority black and Hispanic neighborhoods in Rhode Island. And as you can see, the bank's branches are uniformly located outside of those areas. And given its branch-based lending model, that had significant adverse effects on lending. And the bank knew it. As early as 2011, we allege that the bank was aware of its redlining risk from both internal and external assessments, including from its own compliance department. But even with that information, we allege that no effective changes were made and that Washington Trust did not take adequate steps to remedy the situation and meet its legal obligations. And the effect was severe. Our investigation found that during the, fi <clears throat> the five year period between 2016 and 2021, other banks generated applications from black and Hispanic borrowers in majority black and Hispanic Rhode Island neighborhoods at nearly four times the rate as Washington Trust. And not only did they generate applications, those other banks actually made loans in those neighborhoods at more than four times the rate of Washington Trust, which demonstrates that there were thousands of qualified borrowers for home loans and sufficient mortgage demand in those communities. In contrast, we found that even when it did lend in majority black and Hispanic neighborhoods during the period we looked at, Washington Trust's loans went overwhelmingly to white borrowers. Based on the disparities that we identified, which were statistically significant in every year that we looked at, we allege that Washington Trust violated the Federal Fair Housing Act and the Equal Credit Opportunity Act. Those are the allegations. Let me speak briefly about what we're doing about them. Today, we filed a consent judgment in federal court here in Providence. If approved by the court, the settlement will do the following things. First, and most importantly, as Assistant Attorney General Clark discussed, Washington Trust has committed to invest at least $7 million in a loan subsidy fund to increase mortgage loans, home improvement loans, and home refinance loans in majority black and Hispanic neighborhoods here in Rhode Island. That $7 million figure represents what we believe is the amount of lending that did not occur in these areas as a result of Washington Trust's past practices. And based on the department's experience in other redlining cases, we expect each loan subsidy dollar to generate at least $10 worth of lending. In other words, we expect that the $7 million loan subsidy fund will generate approximately $70 million in mortgage loans in these neighborhoods. The bank is also going to devote a million dollars to outreach and consumer financial education and credit counseling, and it will commit an additional million towards a community development partnership program to promote credit financial education, home ownership, and foreclosure prevention. That's a total of $9 million in targeted financial investment, every dollar of which will go either directly towards making loans available in previously underserved Rhode Island communities or towards efforts to increase access to credit and lending in those communities. Because the bottom line is that every Rhode Islander benefits when all of us, regardless of race, color, or background, has the opportunity to own their home, invest in their community, and build wealth for themselves and their family. Washington Trust has also committed to opening at least two full service branches in these communities in Rhode Island. One will most likely be located in Olneyville and the other at a location yet to be determined. These, along with the other provisions of the settlement, are significant and necessary steps. And I want to acknowledge Washington Trust for its willingness to take those steps. Because make no mistake, our allegations are serious, but I want to commend the bank for cooperating with our investigation and for the fact that once we raised our findings, they worked cooperatively with us to reach an appropriate resolution. And with that, we'll take your questions. Okay, we'll take our first question from Rhode Island. Ian Jones. Um, where do you, where in the organizational structure of Washington Trust do you place the responsibility for this? And do you place any blame on Dennis Alchier, the former Rhode Island Senate minority leader? I believe his current title is Chief, Chief Compliance Officer. 
Well, this is a, I think I'd say it's a pervasive issue throughout the organization, and we place blame throughout the organization, and the organization as a whole is being held accountable. Um, I don't think there's any particular individual who we've signaled out as responsible for this conduct. Our next question will come from Washington. Okay, uh, Brian Crandall from WJR. What led the investigation to Washington Trust? As part of this national initiative, were you looking at all the banks to see what was going on, or was it kind of obvious looking at a map what was happening here with Washington Trust? I have a couple thoughts on that, but I'm initially going to defer to Assistant Attorney General Clark to talk about how we select our uh, targets at these particular investigations. Oh, as I indicated, the Combating Redlining Initiative is focused on uh, confronting uh, a problem that we know is pervasive across the country. We are working with our colleagues at U.S. Attorney's Offices, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, the Office of Comptroller Currency to eliminate this problem root and branch. We are looking at publicly available data, looking at complaints. We are looking at how banks match up to peer institutions lending uh, in the same jurisdiction. Uh, but, but that is how we are going about uh, this effort. And just to add on that, you know, some of the particular things that we looked at in this investigation were the rate of loan applications from neighborhoods, uh, affected neighborhoods compared to other similar lenders, um, the branching pattern of the bank and the record of banks outreach and marketing to other communities. And I think as both I and the Assistant Attorney General mentioned, one of the things that was most stark in determining where to focus our efforts here was the basic four to one ratio between Washington Trust and its peer lenders in this area. Uh, U.S. Attorney, uh, you talk about the enforcement actions uh, per the settlement. Um, is there gonna be an annual review in terms of that $7 million amount? Uh, how is the office going to make sure that Washington Trust is in compliance and how regularly is this going to be um, analyzed? Well, it's not just the office. It's a multi-stage process, the first stage of which, of course, is the court's review and approval of the consent judgment. If the court does that, then the next step would be an assessment by a neutral third party uh, outside assessor that will basically develop a plan for the bank as to how to implement this. Both we and the court will be regularly involved in monitoring that process to ensure that it is carried out both with and consistent with the intent of the settlement and so that it actually benefits the community. Are there any other questions here? Steve Franklin, WPRO. Should state bank regulators have, do they monitor this sort of thing? Should they have picked up on this? And do, can you speak to the state of state bank regulation in Rhode Island? It's not for me to comment on state bank regulators' obligations. All I can tell you is that as far as DOJ is concerned, we enforce the Fair Housing Act and the Equal Credit Opportunity Act. And having found those issues and having found that Washington Trust was apprised of those issues, uh, we took action. And if I might just, how would you characterize the import of this, the significance of this settlement, the investigation and the settlement? I think it's tremendously important. I think, as I mentioned, access to credit by all Rhode Islanders across all of our communities strengthens those communities. It builds stability in those communities. It gives folks the opportunity to invest and build uh, family stability and family wealth. And so every time that anyone is denied access to credit and lending opportunities, it impacts us all. mentioned that the bank was aware of its own redlining as far back as more than a decade ago. Can you say how you how you know they were aware of that? Were there internal communications and was it then just a lack of action to resolve it or as part of your investigation did you find where the communications or something like that where it was uh, no we're not going to expand into these areas? Let me answer that in two parts. First, it's important to understand the period of our settlement focuses on 2016 to 2021, uh, and there's a reason for that. 
because in 2016, the bank made a decision to designate the entire state of Rhode Island as what's called its assessment area. That's basically, for fair lending purposes, the area that it has to, it agrees to serve. The bank made that decision, not federal regulators. And when it did that, it took on the obligation to serve all communities. And our allegation is that based on our investigation, internal documents, including from their compliance department, as well as external assessments, told them that they were not uh, adequately servicing these areas. Uh, one more question. I will, uh, I'll just, if, if I might add, um, we hope that this settlement sends a strong message to the entire sector that it's important for banks to undertake an assessment of uh, their risk here. It's important that they take seriously indicators that may provide evidence that they are engaged in redlining and that they take proactive steps to address it. We have a question from Amanda Milkovich from the Boston Globe. Oh, sure. Just expanding on something that um, that Brian Crandall has said, I wanted to make sure I understand how this came to your attention. Um, since the compliance department of uh, the bank had found issues already, and I imagine um, some lenders, or, or actually some people seeking mortgages, may have filed some complaints. Was this um, did this investigation begin um, as something proactive by your um, by your office, or was this initiated by complaints, whether internally or externally? It began as a result of data analysis by the Department of Justice. As the Assistant Attorney General alluded to, this is a national initiative that was rolled out by the Attorney General of the United States, um, and that was the initial impetus for our investigation. Once we began that and we took uh, further steps to undertake data analysis um, and looked at some of the internal and external communications, we learned more about what was going on here. And I, I will um, just add that through the nationwide combating redlining initiative, we have secured settlements that stretch from California to Rhode Island, down to Houston, and we will leave no stone unturned in going after banks and lenders that engage in modern day redlining. Do we have any virtual questions? If so, now please unmute. Any final questions here? Okay, thank you everybody. Thank you very much.